Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Eric Huntington, and I'm a grad postdoctoral fellow in the Chow Center for Asian Studies at Rice University. I'm pleased to help host this event today. Before we begin, I have just a few announcements. Most importantly, although this is a lecture format webinar, we also want some interactivity. So we've set up the question and answer feature of Zoom so that the speaker can receive and answer your question. Please feel free to type your questions at any time during the lecture, and at the end, we will plan to save some time to respond to them. Also, I believe this event is being recorded, so please check out the Chow Center's YouTube page or the Transnational Asia Speaker Series webpage soon to rewatch this lecture or share it with friends and colleagues. And before we begin, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Chow Center for Asian Studies for hosting this event. The Transnational Asia Speaker Series is an amazing venue for learning about different scholarship on many aspects of Asia, and we have a couple of other great speakers coming up this fall, so please check out our schedule. I also want to especially thank the faculty and staff of the Chow Center and the new Department of Transnational Asian Studies for organizing this event and making it possible. And now to introduce our speaker. Professor Monica Zinn is a world-renowned expert on Buddhist art and literature. Her work is particularly remarkable for the breadth of Asia that she covers, from Southern India to the Western Himalayas and Central Asia along the Silk Road. After initially studying theater arts in Krakow, she pursued her doctorate and habilitation in Indology and Indian art history at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. And she is currently the head of a research group on the Buddhist murals of Kucha on the Northern Silk Road at the Saxon Academy of Sciences and Humanities in Leipzig, Germany. A large body of her work deals with the diverse cultural context of early Buddhism, tying visual imagery to the development and circulation of specific narratives and texts. Her research has become a major reference for numerous traditions, including those from Gandhara, Ajanta, Andhra, and Kucha. Professor Zinn's publications are far too numerous to list, but I will mention a couple of recent highlights. I think the latest is a book entitled Representations of the Parinirvana Story Cycle in Kucha, part of an exciting recent series from Leipzig on Kucha studies. About two years ago, she also published another substantial work on the Kanaganahali Stupa, and she has also published extensive guides to the mural paintings at Ajanta, a volume on the Samsara Chakra, and a variety of articles, especially focusing on relationships between narrative and art. We could spend far too long just listing Professor Zinn's accomplishments, so I will just take this opportunity to say how honored we are to have her speaking with us today and welcome her to begin her lecture entitled The Demons of Kucha. Good evening, everybody. It is evening for me, at least. Um, I hope it's, everything is okay. I still need, um, but nobody says it is not, so I hope it is uh, all well. Uh, Amda, can you hear me? Is it? Uh, anyway, <laughs> all is good. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, let us start with the lecture because the lecture is a little bit too long. So I just have to uh, hurry up a little bit. Um, here we start. Um, uh, I'm a little bit nervous and hope all will go how well with this technique. The demons of Kucha. The subject is really interesting and I hope you'll start to uh, like them or perhaps be afraid of them. But um, uh, just to, uh, before I start, uh, I wanted to uh, make first two points just, that, just to put you uh, into the subject. Um, I will start with uh, wild mountain landscapes depicted in, uh, in uh, our paintings and also with the paintings um, themselves and then with the, with the area also. So here we are uh, to the north of the Taklamakan uh, desert. Uh, it is already on the first view, a good area for, for uh, demons because we are somehow in the middle of nowhere between a uh, great culture of Asia. Uh, actually that uh, such culture like there of, uh, on the North Silk Road uh, could appear there. That's already sort of uh, interesting for uh, of demonic uh, reasons. It is not only um, 
desert, the Taklamakan desert, but uh, there are high mountains uh, around. And over there, uh, in this, um, in the mountains, there are man-made uh, caves. There are many of them, absolutely many. Um, uh, we count with uh, at least 300 painted caves and only like a third part uh, was uh, painted. There are many unpainted caves uh, also. And they are clustered uh, into several uh, sites, uh, the most important being Kizil, but I will show you pictures also from Sinsim or Kuntura. So that this is how uh, the Kucha area uh, looks like. And uh, inside the caves, um, there are fantastic paintings where they are preserved. It's absolutely great. Uh, you see that there was just like a carpet on, on the walls. Everything was completely painted. Now, um, why I'm talking to you about this area from Leipzig? There were four German Turfan expeditions. The name was Turfan, but uh, the most important findings were from Kucha uh, on the beginning of the 20th century uh, with two important um, scientists, uh, Albert Grünwedel and Albert von Lecoq. They went there and uh, came back with huge um, scientific materials, uh, absolute great uh, pictures, uh, a lot of uh, manuscripts, uh, mostly Sanskrit manuscripts, like you see here, manuscripts on palm leaves. It means important from India or manuscript made there. And also um, manuscripts in two languages, in Sanskrit and in Tokarian, and they are also bilingual in Tokarian B. And this Tokarian, it's, it was really uh, of importance. This, this um, the people staying there, they were Tokarians, uh, Indo-European language. I will show you pictures of them um, after like they, they uh, depicted themselves in the caves. They were, um, they had blue eyes, they had red uh, or uh, blonde hair. So Indo-European uh, people, for them, it uh, was easier to learn Sanskrit than, than Chinese, and apparently they were really keeping on this um, Indian culture. German uh, expedition brought a lot of um, artifacts uh, to Berlin, and they also learned how to um, take pictures from, from the wall, and those pictures were uh, also taken to Berlin, uh, like uh, here, the Buddha entering Parinirvana. Only that uh, the picture below, it's what we have from then uh, today. A lot of those pictures were destroyed during the Second World War. World War. Uh, all found their way to, to uh, St. Petersburg um, or are today in uh, around 20, 25 um, galleries and um, museums all over the world. They were not only Germans uh, who took uh, pictures from the wall, but they were really the most effective. Uh, it is of importance to know where from the paintings are coming, um, to recognize the programs uh, of, um, of the painting. So this is uh, really a lot of work. And we have a research center for that uh, in Leipzig. Leipzig is just one hour by train from, from Berlin, where all those, those um, uh, paintings uh, are being hosted in the uh, museum. Uh, I can only promise maybe this year, maybe next year, we will have a database uh, of our project. Um, virus is not our friend, so maybe that, that will uh, take longer time, but sooner or later you will have access to the paintings. Just a little bit, um, only very short about history of the area, uh, which is of importance for my uh, lecture later. The Chinese science, um, uh, tends to date our paintings quite early. Uh, it is um, not a point that uh, early or later, but the point of influence. So when you uh, date them early, actually you presuppose direct influence from Gandhara, which is goes till, till like 300. Um, we um, 
like hypothesis, maybe, maybe still change it, but it looks to us that um, the painting start uh, around 500. That could have been one generation earlier, like 470 or, or 80, but definitely not 100 uh, years or still uh, earlier. So, um, and this is actually uh, like uh, Grünwedel and um, after him Waldschmidt uh, saw that, and they connected uh, this first um, time Heftalite empire with in the first Indo-Iranian style, and after that, in the second uh, part of the sixth century, when the Turks uh, came, there was the beginning of the second Indo-Iranian style. So this is of important to know that uh, we actually have uh, no uh, Chinese influences before the middle of the 7th century. That's an uh, important uh, issue. Uh, for us coming, as I do, uh, from Indian uh, art history, it's actually impossible to um, date and speak just uh, earlier. As you see, um, just one of examples, um, those uh, monk's robes just like gluing on, on the bodies. Uh, we think at once about uh, art around five, uh, 500, maybe a little bit uh, earlier, we think about uh, Ajanta already because of uh, mandorlas behind uh, the Buddha. This is what uh, really looks like, like in Kizil, not necessary that the uh, Buddha's from, uh, from Gandhara. But uh, what seems to be really similar to, to our paintings uh, is late Gandhara, like Bamiyan from uh, sixth century and uh, later, this double nimbus around the head and around the body. Uh, some uh, details um, like this jewelry here or even uh, fabrics, it's exactly uh, the same. So for the time being, we tend uh, to date those uh, paintings quite uh, late. There are different uh, shape of um, caves uh, in Kucha, uh, but the most important is the so-called central pillar cave. Uh, it was meant for circumambulation, it's actually not a pillar, but uh, it makes the uh, important Parinirvana space in this uh, rear part. We have depictions of the Buddha entering Parinirvana or um, um, War of Relics. Uh, on the side in the main hall, there are depictions of sermon scenes. There's a Buddha in the middle of every scene. Uh, and uh, on the barrel vaults, uh, representations with the Buddha in the middle. So there are also sermon scenes or there are Jatakas. So there is uh, really a lot, a huge amount of narrative depictions um, in one interior, very often more than 100 different topics uh, depicted. And, uh, we'll talk about it later. Please have a look at uh, even below, underneath the sermon uh, scenes, there still can be uh, uh, depic uh, depictions of different uh, Jatakas. Uh, Usually there is Maitreya sitting um, above the uh, entrance uh, door and on the main wall above the um, a niche in which the Buddha was sitting, there is a landscape. Here already really important point of, mm, for, uh, part of, of the lecture uh, starts because uh, we have depictions of um, different deities, also um, demons uh, here. First of all, there is uh, Indra and uh, Panchashika depicted here on the side. That's a very well known story about um, Indra's visit uh, by the Buddha depicted in uh, Gandhara, also somewhere else. So this is on the main wall, what we have quite often depicted, uh, but please have a look at uh, above. There are deities and there is a landscape depicted. In many caves, uh, only below, sometimes not at all, 
and uh, above um, uh, flying deities on the left side, deities with uh, cobra hoods uh, behind, so there are nagas on the right side, uh, deities making music, uh, so those deities are really of great importance. Important to know also that um, these mountains, they make background to narrative representations of different kinds, and there are also representations especially of importance and playing in the mountains. It is not only in Rashaila, which is arranged, uh, arranged around the sitting Buddha, that can be a story about uh, assassination of uh, Devadatta on the Buddha, here is uh, also known from uh, from Gandhara. Devadatta is throwing a boulder on the uh, Buddha. Yaksha Kumbira uh, is catching that. So that we can have arranged uh, arranged around the um, niche and in the niche, and the Buddha must be imagined today. So mountains are really everywhere, sometimes on the peg holes for, for this um, three-dimensional representations of the mountains, but I hope you can see uh, similarities between these uh, objects on the main wall and uh, representations uh, on this uh, rhomboidal um, mountains on the side. Um, where from the form is coming, actually nobody knows. This um, uh, silver vase is usually taken for, for um, possible um, similarities, but since nobody can really date it, uh, we simply don't know. Uh, important to remember that uh, the, uh, in the first Indo-Iranian style, we have just depictions of of landscape with different animals, meditating rishis, nagas, uh, meditating monkeys even. Uh, so this is how it looks uh, above when you uh, visit the, the cave. In uh, This is a wonderful example today preserved only in old uh, photographs uh, of special importance because um, there is a sea underneath. Uh, here on the side, only pictures from, from Grunwell today, different aquatic um, uh, animals. And uh, on one side, there is an ocean. And in the middle of this ocean is Sumeru with Indra in uh, Triastrensha heaven sitting above. So the mountains uh, on the side of, of that in this barrel vaults uh, really get importance. That's a uh, romantic uh, landscape with a lot of different deities, different uh, genies. Uh, it stays like that also in the second Indo-Iranian style, uh, the different being that uh, we get narratives inside every mountain, uh, but uh, also on the side there is just purely representations of, um, of landscape. And already there, there are special uh, topics connected with different demons like Hariti. Uh, to recognize the story, there is a baby sitting in Buddha's bowl in, in front of uh, Buddha's uh, throne. Uh, or we have different demons attacking uh, the Buddha, like here many armed um, demon with uh, like Shiva, like Trishula in his hand. But first of all, we are here with absolutely charming representations of the mountains. And important to remember that this is just not mountain, but uh, there are different um, genies coming from above. When you are coming from um, studying Indology, as, as I, I am coming, uh, you have to remember works like Kumara Zambava uh, with descriptions of a landscape in the Himalaya with glowing herbs and meditating rishis and different uh, hybrid beings. Uh, so this is how, um, how Himalaya should be imagined. And uh, of course, we have representations of uh, such. Uh, landscapes uh, in, in art with a deity sitting in the middle with nagas on the side everything on, on the ocean and uh, different um, half uh, women have horse or, or musicians or uh, wild um, 
um, mountain fox uh, in, in this uh, area. As you see it here, it is on the entrance to the, uh, to the stupa, stupa number three in uh, Samshi. Uh, I don't have other explanation like pan-Indian explanation that when you have to reach uh, gods or you have to go to, to something really uh, holy, you have to cross Himalaya. Everybody knows uh, gods are sitting on Sumeru. So uh, this is the area how you are supposed to go. Uh, this is Pan-Indian. It is not only in Buddhist monasteries when we uh, have it. And coming um, to the time which is connected with our Kucha paintings, exactly in this uh, time, there are representation of mountains like we have uh, in National Kutara, the plinth of, uh, of the temple. It's a representation of mountains with different genies also. The most important uh, of course, being um, landscapes on the entrances to um, to the caves in, in Ajanta, those uh, Bodhisattvas kings are always uh, shown uh, with mountains behind them. So um, the tradition uh, can be Indian if that was understood in such a way in Kucha, we of course cannot uh, know, but uh, at least it's possible to, to show this uh, pictorial tradition may be coming from, uh, from India. Now, uh, when, um, Dr. Huntington uh, invited me for the lecture, uh, I didn't know what to talk about, but preparing it, I realized that it's actually quite a good topic uh, when you want to talk about um, transnational Asia, uh, because um, I suppose nobody really show, uh, could see that this uh, demons, so uh, when we have appearance, they, they have to come uh, from, from somewhere. Um, intriguing thing for a longer time was this depiction from Dunghuang uh, because there is a demon uh, with a second uh, face on the belly uh, and long time I didn't know about such uh, demons from, from Kucha. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful demons in the um, scene of enlightenment, it's Naga, Nara Vijaya, but not everywhere are uh, demons with the second face um, on, on the belly. Uh, that was mistake of Grünwedel. Actually, he did not recognize them. We have this wonderful uh, representation and uh, Grünwedel are usually making really good uh, drawings. But here he did not recognize that um, and there is a mustache and uh, from the mouth of, uh, of this demon, uh, a snake is coming. Also here uh, he made drawing with uh, three big pearls. It is not this particular piece survived, so I hope you can see the second face on the belly of this individual. Uh, reading uh, art historical um, books, uh, you will be confronted with the work Udaramukha. This is how, to, how Indian art historian uh, call this uh, sort of um, beings. Um, as far as I know, the word is not existent. It is only in art, for art history. Uh, what we do have is Udare Mukha, face on uh, on belly, but uh, the story connected with this word um, uh, is in uh, Ramayana, Rama pushed the face, the, the head of uh, this Danava into his belly. So it is not that he has the second belly, but uh, his face was on his uh, belly. And this is exactly how it is understood. Um, for example, in Mahavastu, um, there are different beings attacking uh, the Buddha during the enlightenment. And this is a Shirshaka Kambanda. So that's um, uh, Kambanda without, without a uh, head. And it seems that um, beings like that were really uh, depicted. I know something from uh, Ajanta and I hope many from uh, Nagarjuna Kondra from, from yeah, Andhra. So here they are. I don't know a single example from uh, somewhere from Gandhara or farther to, to, to the north. But uh, in Andhra, they are really popular. So ah, Shirshaka Kabandas um, are they really not what we are searching for uh, individuals with a second uh, face on the belly. 
Uh, there are some candidates where from such beings could come uh, because we have in uh, Gandhara representations like that, not very many, but still there are. Uh, in one example in, in uh, the museum in Berlin also. Where can it come from? Um, possible, I don't know, but maybe somebody not understand something like, um, um, something like that, or maybe this, that's uh, very old, but uh, found in a Scythian uh, tomb from a later time, so even that could have been known in, in Asia. Now, um, can we take this uh, Gandharan example um, for predecessors of our um, beings with the second belly? Um, I wouldn't do so. That was really... Uh, Surprise for me, um, I'm not so good in, in uh, Gandhara, much better with, with Andhra. And in Andhra, you have dwarfs everywhere in um, Maravijaya scenes and not really in Gandhara. Actually, there are no dwarfs in Gandhara for really a long time. When we have them in Kanaganahari, uh, actually really everywhere. Um, this is the scene, so they are just to be found. Uh, we know them from Satavahana uh, time in Sanchi, uh, and they continue to be in Amaravati and um, in, in uh, different places. So there are dwarfs everywhere, and in one point of time, one of uh, those get a second uh, face on, on, uh, on his stomach. And that continues uh, 300 or, or later, so Nagarjuna Konda, we also have them. Uh, they really look um, like in uh, our paintings. And uh, it is interesting that in uh, Gandhara, actually we have um, such individuals uh, in something what I would consider uh, to be really late Gandhara. So um, it is not the only example I can say that something is from Andhra is coming to, to Gandhara. Actually, uh, we can observe observe it uh, many, many times. And um, it stays there, uh, continuation of dwarfs um, uh, in uh, Kashmir. And of course, in India proper, we have several times in uh, Gupta time um, uh, art, like here in, in Ajanta, not only in Maravijaya context, uh, also in others. and. Um, goes uh, out from uh, Buddhist art into Shaiva uh, art as well. So uh, when you search for, for predecessors, uh, I would say this is not going uh, back to uh, Gandhara examples, but uh, actually uh, this is this um, development which uh, took place mostly in southern India, maybe in, in Gupta, India, Ajanta and so on. Uh, and that was predecessor from, uh, for Kucha and also for Dudhuang. Now, um, the demons of uh, Kucha, the, the main part, uh, why they are not demons, but this is the reason why I started uh, research about it. There are uh, our people, there are Tokarians. Um, they represented themselves uh, in, uh, in caves. Uh, you can see here uh, red hair, um, uh, that how they look like. We have the depictions, but uh, as a matter of fact, we really know very, very little about them. There are these Buddhist monuments, uh, no secular buildings, secular um, text, um, are uh, only few and uh, not very much telling. Uh, so about, um, it's next to nothing we, we know about them. Uh, what is really uh, interesting that um, they really tried to be like Indian. Kucha Mahadevi, Kucha Maharaja, that, that, how, how they call themselves. Um, they look different, but uh, this Indian culture was uh, for them of real importance. It must have been a part of um, their... Um, identity and probably because of that uh, they also produced this um, caves uh, which repeat the same uh, 
program of, of paintings. Uh, Robert Schaff um, uh, proposed a couple of years ago, uh, in, in this really interesting um, paper, that maybe um, the caves were made um, for mortuary um, uh, praxis. Uh, that was not like uh, Schaff wanted to uh, show that, because um, actually what he proposed, that there were urns with, with ashes closed in the uh, caves, and nobody went into the caves uh, after. Um, that we cannot see, the caves were in use, we have a lot of root, we have a lot of repaintings, and we also have uh, this really interesting uh, statement uh, by Lecoq. Um, they found a small niche, only 60 uh, centimeter high, uh, very high, that was um, 18 meters, uh, so above the, the, um, the caves. And uh, in this um, niche, there was place for several um, urns uh, like that. So only this one was discovered, but uh, Lecoq recognized that there were uh, ashes uh, there. So for, for elite of uh, Tokarian peoples, there was um, the, uh, the praxis. Now, um, what Schaff uh, wrote um, gained recently a really important support um, in other ways because um, above a, a representation of the Buddha entering the Parinirvana, an inscription uh, what was discovered. Uh, and inscriptions is really uh, extremely interesting because it uh, tells about Sharada ritual, which is not Buddhist, which is Brahmanica Hindu uh, a ritual for, for a ritual of death. And this is not only in this, um, uh, inscription, but we also have in one um, manuscript in Tokarian, also about this Shraddha uh, ritual for father and mother. So that is possible that the caves were in one way or another used for, for uh, among others, probably also for such rituals. And also this um, painting is of huge importance. Uh, I hope you can recognize this is a left hand and there is a round object lying on the palm of, of the hand. This um, paint, this hand belongs to, to the painting showing um, a demon uh, who is trying to stop a boat. There are Tokarian people inside the boat um, and probably he just got a, a coin uh, to make it possible that they reach another shore. So. Should we understand him like Karen? Maybe because uh, we know it from from literature. It's, it's uh, really well documented that uh, uh, um, to put a coin uh, into the mouth of the undead people is really uh, quite uh, well known um, ritual in the area documenting the text, which was certainly known in, in Kucha, and also very well documented uh, in the uh, area, like for example, in this ex uh, excavation in, in Termes. So uh, possible it is in any race. Now, um, so the demons might can have uh, different meaning also just helping to, to get to another shore. Um, what um, archaeologists uh, sometimes don't, don't believe uh, us that we recognize very early paintings, very early caves in the area which are far away from the center. Um, so they have good reason for that. Uh, Vignato um, uh, thinks that um, um, there was bad water supplies, no sun, uh, really far away. Um, so why should we um, expect uh, early caves there? But uh, amongst these early caves, um, there is the one with representation of, of corpse. And uh, now I can only... Um, who is interesting then absolutely great book uh, by Robert de Caroli, uh, who um, collected um, different literary sources about smell of the corpses in the monastery. That was an issue. There must have been a rules in the, in the Vinayas, what we can do. So the monasteries were actually 
really not far away from uh, from can corpses uh, so that also is to, to be put in in the head and when you have such neighbors of the monastery still more you need um, uh, yakshas and nagas taking care of you and um, we have a lot of them here standing on the side of uh, of the doors An example from uh, sim sim 48 on one side there is a couple of, of nagas with this wonderful uh, cobra hoods uh, behind the male there, there are many and only four uh, behind the female uh, Nagini. On the other side, um, two yakshas, one in military attire, another was bare uh, upper body. Uh, so yakshas and Naga standing on, on the side of the entrances. Um, that repeats several times. I, of course, cannot uh, show you all, but this particular um, example is really worth to, to be uh, seen on the right side. This is a Yaksha, very interesting because there is a buffalo on the head, so maybe Yama or something like that. Uh, and on the other side uh, of the door, so in the reveal of, of the uh, entrance door, this is a Naga uh, who once uh, knew something about Indian culture, was recognized at once. So there are Nagas, uh, cobra hoods be behind. This is a Naga. But this particular one is different, and I'm not aware about a, even a single example like that uh, from India. Uh, there's an elephant head uh, on the end of uh, one Naga body. Um, and not only elephant, but there is also a particular flower, so it looks like uh, somebody was playing with, a, uh, with the word. There's Naga, like snake deity, Naga, which also means an elephant, and perhaps also Naga Pushpa, so, um, uh, which tells us something about knowledge of uh, Sanskrit, of course, um, so a really interesting um, representation. So why um, Tokarians uh, like to have different uh, Nagas or Yakshas around, um, we'll probably never know, but I can imagine that in the area with earthquake, it's really important um, to have stories about good yaksha uh, who can, can uh, catch boulders that they don't uh, follow you uh, follow you and uh, uh, Tokarians also re represented themselves be, being called but different uh, male or female deities when uh, searching for names of different um, uh, deities or, or demons, um, uh, it is really disappointing when you search in Tokarian text. Um, Tokarians uh, were so crazy about Indian culture that they simply repeat everything in Indians. Timburu and uh, Chitra is actually not even from, from Buddhist text. I don't know if there are in Buddhist text also, but you can find them in Ramayana or Mahabharata. So there are a list of different uh, deities worshipping the Buddha, but not a single, which we don't know from India. Uh, better are Chinese uh, sources, uh, which at least uh, tell us some um, names of um, nag Nagas and, and the Yakshas from the area. There's quite early text, uh, still 90,000 Nagarajas taking care of, of Kucha. This is also interesting text um, from the seventh beginning of the seventh century. So the tradition that there are different uh, Nagas taking uh, care, protecting Kucha uh, was definitely there. Uh, for me, uh, difficult because I cannot uh, recognize um, this particular uh, individuals uh, in the painting. Uh, how to recognize them at all. So there are some stories about yakshas, um, like that they steal really relics from, uh, from the cremation. So this is how yaksha look like, or the story about yaksha atavika, definitely the story we have uh, sources uh, for that. So um, this how you uh, show um, yaksha. Uh, 
ears, pointed ears, uh, something uh, which looks like uh, feathers on the above the forehead, um, and uh, quite Bavarian-looking uh, cuff warmers. Um, uh, for some of that, you can find tradition in, in India, but actually um, such um, ears is probably in every culture around the world, you can have uh, animal ears. Uh, more, more interesting, those um, uh, calf warmers, uh, what was noticed already by Grünwedel, a colleague of mine in this um, Kochak Nagel promised to write a um, paper about that. Um, so it is quite possible that it is pan deity um, uh, which uh, directly influenced uh, how the uh, demons uh, of uh, Kucha look like with these two um, feathers which were probably uh, two horns but standing uh, together. Um, taken probably from literature uh, are pot ears, kumba karna. They are not completely unknown in um, Gandhara, uh, but as far as I see, they are actually really very rare. Uh, and when you uh, know like how kumba look like, um, actually uh, it's easy to, to uh, recognize them. Um, in the scene when the yakshas are running, carrying um, uh, relics of Buddha, actually we have uh, three different uh, ears, animals, pointed ears, animals, ears, or kumbhakarnas, so probably there was not particular uh, importance of this kind of uh, um, imagery. Now, uh, Hindu deities, there are many. There are very many, uh, first of all, Shiva, uh, with several heads and depicted uh, worshiping uh, the Buddha. Um, usually there is Vishnu on another side. Um, here they are, maybe on drawings that, um, better to be seen. Uh, Vishnu is blue, is riding on, on Garuda, uh, Shiva has Parvati uh, with him and is sitting uh, on the bull. Um, if they were understood like um, Vishnu, Shiva or important deities, I don't know, um, because they are actually depicted only between demons. Um, the iconography which repeats uh, sun and moon uh, hold um, upper arms, uh, that's not typical, not very often in India, but uh, exists. Uh, when you know it once, you will recognize very many. Actually, in every cave where paintings are preserved, you can, you can see them. And uh, that's the typical. Once recognized scene, uh, you will recognize them everywhere. Here's a chicken and a cow below. So when you see something like that, that must be uh, Vishnu. And, um, and Shiva, I go further. This is of importance to recognize. You know already this calf warmers is actually typical for, uh, for demons, for yakshas. And this really repeats Vishnu and Shiva are shown here among the demons. More than that, they belong to the group of Maravijaya sometimes. They are really attacking uh, the Buddha, not only once, but several times. So Vishnu and Shiva belong among the uh, 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 demons. Um, I cannot be sure, but it looks um, with many arms, that's probably also um, Shiva. She, he is attacking with Shula and with Trishula, maybe Mahakala, whoever uh, it is. And um, there is still something more interesting. Uh, in only one example, I know it in the paintings, which is now in St. Petersburg. Uh, Grunbel made drawings of uh, this individual. Uh, for us knowing Indian art history, this is, of course, Indra. But the point is uh, representations of Indra like that covered with, with uh, oops, I should I should go to the end. I will hurry up. So uh, representations are like that um, 
are known from Central Asia, but uh, are not uh, very often. We have uh, other depictions of um, uh, demons, repeats uh, a representation of uh, city of, of the demons, there is a lady sitting there, so um, uh, no monkeys, but uh, so we cannot uh, uh, think that that's Ramayana, but depictions are like that, repeat and repeat. And uh, first of all, there are a lot of representations of different, different demons. They can be Nagas among them, there are different sort of uh, Yakshas, and there are also bold headed uh, yakshas and there are four kings of directions always showed with military attire they repeat they repeat they repeat actually uh, this is indian and documented in many uh, texts that um, yakshas and um, uh, king uh, of, of directions they are coming from different um, uh, point of, of, uh, of compass. And we have in Kucha that uh, also is really absolutely great examples that um, Nagas are depicted in the one side, Gandharvas in another, there are squinches of, of, on the side of the, uh, of the um, cupola. And um, they must be Kumbandas. They really look like, like demons that they, they with horn or, or with bone, uh, really terrible ones. And they are bold. There are uh, some of them at least are depicted bold. And interestingly, it keeps also on this um, direction that Kumbandas are shown in the south and the Yakshas in the north. That there are Kumbandas, we have uh, interesting inscription of that. So there is one, uh, he's standing uh, holding a, a goat and he's uh, bold headed. Uh, there is an inscription saying Kumbanda drinking blood. Um, uh, Probably, well, I still wait for, for another picture from Musegi um, Mem. Maybe we will still know uh, what's the name of another, on, on his colleague on another side. But anyway, this uh, bold headed, there are probably Kumbandas, and they repeat and repeat and repeat. I will skip that one because the time is um, maybe still uh, this one. That in uh, Kumtura uh, 34, uh, in squinches are um, uh, yakshas, demons, and in the middle um, there are 12 uh, individuals, From some of them you can uh, follow where prototypes are coming, uh, but uh, more important is that most of them um, have weapons uh, with them. They are, they are, and also, interestingly, they also keep that Nagas are depicted in, in the West. Uh, so this um, really continuation of tradition. So just putting that all together, um, uh, some are preserved, some known only from descriptions of Grunwedel, but uh, we have um, uh, Nagas and Yakshas on the entrances. On the side, um, uh, in, in the antechambers, there are all always scenes uh, with um, uh, different scenes with, with uh, um, uh, Hindu deities or, or uh, different demons. And that continues also in the inside uh, the cave. Uh, when you count them all together, I will risk um, a statement that at least a quarter yeah, of the paintings in Kucha represent different demons. There are also Jatakas in connections with demons. And of course, that there are represented of such important places. And you have in the corridors on one side, Maravija and First Sermon, and opposite of them, uh, stories about uh, demons. So they, they really gain importance. We know it from, uh, from India. Of course, we do in Ajanta, they are this. this um, uh, chapels of um, yakshas on the side of the Buddha, but in Kucha they look different. They are really danger, and even Vajrapani can uh, have a really danger look that repeats everywhere. The four kings of directions are always shown with this big uh, danger faces and and. Um, uh, 
they look like like demons as far as i'm aware absolutely everywhere so just um uh, last slides of uh, of my presentation the demons of kucha who were they actually today uh, i would like to show you one uh, painting which is now in the museum in, uh, in berlin um, it's like seven uh, meters of paintings uh, 40 centimeters high showing a fight of one single hero against different demons uh, i was trying to um, uh, find a place how, how to recognize where exactly they were. So there is uh, uh, this reconstruction by Chao Li. So probably there were eight uh, scenes above and still below this um, representation of a fight against different uh, demons. Uh, when I'm right, that was just on the left and right. You have to go in production around. Uh, so on the end of uh, every war, uh, there was the hero was coming to the king of, uh, of the demons, many had it, uh, one of them being Shiva with, uh, with Trishula, with many uh, hands, and uh, the story ends here when the demons are kneeling in front of, of the hero. Uh, one would tend to say that could be a Jataka, uh, but um, I'm actually not aware about the representation of uh, Bodhisattva being so cruel and towards ladies. They may be uh, Rakshasis or, or uh, demoness, um, but still there are women and the Bodhisattva actually uh, does not do it. So and the question is, uh, what is this uh, picture showing us and what actually we can uh, expect in this place? Now, uh, at the beginning, I told you about our dating at the project around 500 uh, CE, maybe a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, we must remember that that was this time, this 50 years that changed uh, India. And uh, all this uh, Hunnic war, all these um, uh, changes in India must have been of really huge importance for our Tokarians. And we must remember, as Hans Bakker wonderfully um, uh, quotes, that um, that was this time around 500 CE uh, when uh, Buddhist beliefs on Kali Yuga uh, appeared. All this uh, Shaivism, like uh, really danger um, power. So. I really can imagine that these uh, paintings, which, uh, as I said, uh, take like a quarter of representations in, in Kucha, might have uh, had something to do with the politics of that time and were of absolutely great importance for our Kuchayan people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zin. That was wonderful. Um, we I want to remind everyone that we have the question and answer uh, feature uh, available in Zoom. So uh, please go ahead and type your um, questions uh, to us, and and uh, I'll maybe try to moderate and uh, read them to Professor Zin uh, whenever you're ready. Should I stop my presentation or should I keep it? What? Uh, it's up to you. We might want to uh, go back to some slides if some of the questions. Okay, so maybe I keep it fine. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, first question comes from uh, Jennifer Owen Henry, who's a specialist in Gandharan Buddhist art, uh, working on Hariti. Uh, and sh uh, she says that she's familiar with uh, many later images along the Southern Silk Road, uh, but is uh, interested to see the example that you mentioned on the Northern Silk Road. Could you say anything more about Hariti uh, in this context? Um, just recently, some more were recognized. Uh, so previously we knew in this um, uh, small representation on the ceiling, so um, like three or four uh, were well known, just show, showing the Buddha, the female um, uh, demon, and in front of the Buddha thr Buddha's throne is um, a bowl and the child is sitting inside. Um, now we know three more uh, representations also from um, 
um, from the side walls and they are big and important. Uh, so there are really important uh, paintings, not only that uh, 198 I, I showed before, but uh, really big important representation. So Hariti was an issue in, in, uh, in Kucha, which is uh, absolutely normal. This is Mula Sarvastivada uh, tradition. So actually uh, it's in uh, Ajanta, um, the story of uh, conversion of Kariti is depicted and in Kucha. So it's actually that how it should be. Great, thank you. We also have a question from uh, Michael Ruby who asks, uh, where is Kucha relative to Dunhuang? And I might just add on to that can you speak a little bit about any possible historical relationships between Kucha and Dunhuang? Um, I was hoping this question will not come because <laughs> <laughs> my lecture was already too long. So <laughs> when I start with that, it will really um, uh, continue. Um, so we see absolutely a lot of influences uh, of Kucha and um, uh, um, the issue is complicated, um, but um, there are some topics uh, which are absolutely uh, the same. Some uh, Jatakas, for example, which repeat in, in Kucha and uh, look exactly the same uh, way in, in, in Dunhua. But so in this point, um, it is all fine and we understand that. Uh, it is more interesting when we have topics in, in uh, Dunhua, which we don't have in, in, uh, in Kucha. So there was also the Southern Silk Road, uh, so direct uh, from uh, from Gandhara, um, uh, several Jatakas uh, are in um, Dunhuan and not a single time, even when we have so many Jatakas, but they are simply not, not uh, represented in, in Kucha. Uh, so that's a complicated point. Um, uh, if you are interested, uh, something which may be one day i was really hoping the discussion will start but uh, somehow don't want people ignore us so nobody started the discussion uh, there is a short uh, paper um, what was the title the case of repainted cave uh, it is one cave in in kucha uh, about um, painting there, uh, Grünwedel uh, and also modern researchers from China write that there is the first Indo-Iranian style uh, and above that there, there is a, uh, there are boring rows of the, of the Buddha. Uh, it's really not difficult when you search for that and one piece of that is in in berlin so i really could uh, scrutinize that it is other way around uh, there's the first indo-iranian style and underneath are buddhas which you actually can find only in in dunhuan we don't have them so this is this not pre first Indo-Iranian style, which we have just one, recognized just one. So in my opinion, and I would really love that somebody said, no, it's absolutely stupid, or they said, no, maybe, uh, but let us start a discussion that in the earlier time, um, we have influences from China. We have Mahayana, which explains us, uh, Kumarajiva and other guys from Kucha who are actually oriented into Mahayana um, direction. And after that, around 500, um, this first Indo-Iranian style starts with um, Tokarians who wanted uh, only early Buddhism and only Indian Buddhism. And uh, so there was really important uh, turn. So. If you could please read this only few pages, the case of the important uh, of the repainted cave, and um, if you can just write uh, a replique that I'm absolutely stupid, it's okay, it's absolutely okay, but um, we should discuss about it. <laughs> Oh, and like after really that, yeah, after that, there are again influences from uh, when when this 
really great paintings are started, influenced from India, directly from, from, uh, from the land of the Buddha, of course, uh, Dun Huang was uh, interested in that, but this is other wave in other direction. Wow, that sounds like a really amazing possibility. I look forward to learning more about that. Um, we also have a, a question from Clark Transom, who asks about the Chinese classic journey to the West, uh, which has a lot of demons in it. Uh, and he asks, did this uh, presence of demons in the story come from traveling through this region, uh, or did Chinese demons influence the Himalayan, Himalayan culture in any way? Well, that's a um, good question, but I don't know if I know an answer or I don't know if we will ever know the answer. Um, uh, quite annoying when you read um, early books um, about Kucha, uh, Grünwedel, it is really annoying that he writes about uh, Tantra. Uh, for him, that was uh, everything tantric. Uh, we cannot blame him because um, that what we know Sanskrit uh, Buddhist was discovered only there. Manuscripts were found. Uh, so before that, people knew Theravadin from, from the South and Tibetan culture. So for him, um, he could recognize uh, Tibetan culture in, in, in the paintings. And um, so when we read it with our knowledge about it, with all these manuscripts um, in Sanskrit, uh, which have nothing to do with, with uh, uh, Tantra, of course, which are actually quite close to, to um, Pali tradition. Um, but as a matter of fact, what we see there, when Vajrapani is turning to um, Dharmapala, when he is danger, uh, it is a lot of, um, of the feeling of actually this late Buddhism. And all these um, terrible yakshas are actually there, I think so, um, to um, keep all these um, bad forces uh, apart. And um, that forces, um, so this is quite possible, this, this Himalaya culture like we know it today with, with um, tantric uh, tradition. I don't know if I answer your question, but um, I hope I don't know anything better. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just doing my best to relay the question. So thank you for the answer. Um, for our next question, actually, someone sent me an image to share. So I don't know. I'm going to try to share. Uh, if I can stop your screen sharing, if you don't mind, uh, and I, I will share. I can share stop my yeah. Um, so someone sent this image. Uh, can you see oh, yeah. there a figure of a demon? Oh, so the question is. Um, let's see if I can get this right. Uh, so this is from uh, Nanshu uh, at the uh, Chen at the um, Rice University. And the question is, uh, Shinken, meaning the beheaded, as a warrior whose head was chopped off by the Yellow Emperor, uh, uh, a uh, mythical ruler of Chinese antiquity, uh, uh, and they transformed his belly into a second face and continued fighting the Yellow Emperor. The story is recorded in the classic of Mountains and Seas, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which may have existed as early as the fourth century, but took its uh, present form later. And uh, we're wondering if there's some connection between these figures. In fourth century could be, or maybe not. Maybe mankind uh, could find two times the same solution. Um, I can only say that this story of uh, from Ramayana about Kambanda, Danava Kambanda, um, uh, Rama pushed uh, his face into his belly. Um, if you illustrate that, it would be absolutely the same. <laughs> so, yeah, but... Um, how can we know? Okay, I'll I like the idea. That. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop sharing that image. We have another question from uh, Diego uh, Lukota. Uh, thank you for the wonderfully informative lecture. Uh, given the situation of Xinjiang uh, and the current Chinese leadership, what is the future of research on Kizil and the Taklamakan area look like? Uh, are the paintings preserved um, uh, in, in or out of China? And are the archaeological and photograph records enough to conduct research without access to the caves? 
Mm. Hello, Diego. Nice to know you are here. <laughs> um, we have problems uh, with cooperation with our uh, Chinese colleagues, um, but I would say um, the problems are on the level of institution, but not on the level of uh, friends. So there is still in exchange uh, and um, uh, we are in in, uh, in contact. Uh, we are organizing next year a conference of Sechak um, uh, with focusing on, on Kucha. And I really hope uh, colleagues from um, Kucha Research Institute or other institutions in China working on Kucha will join us. Um, <sighs> Nobody have, has been there for for uh, last couple of um, of years, like like two years. Uh, actually, nobody visited the site. Uh, I really hope that the situation, because of virus or whatever, uh, will be easier soon, and uh, we can uh, work together. I, I really believe um, it it will work, and uh, actually our. Uh, our project um, that was the absolutely main issue that we finally work together uh, to this project um, one really important part uh, of that is annotated bibliography and there are people from uh, china south korea and japan making summaries of um, uh, in every language, just English summary that we can communicate. We are also thinking about the German research uh, translated in English or in Chinese that uh, we finally can work together. The point is that um, this early research on, uh, on China is in German. Early research on Tukaria is in German. Uh, so nobody has access to that. And after uh, the research in China started, it started in Chinese because of, uh, of language um, barrier, we are working on two levels, not together. So uh, let us hope the best. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question also from Natasha Michaels. Uh, for your purposes of analysis, uh, how are you defining the, the term demon? Huh. <laughs> That's the most difficult question ever. <laughs> um, There's a rubber term, like yaksha, actually, like yaksha. So uh, yaksha is actually a beautiful person, an ugly person, and uh, was changing during the time. So um, I simply don't know. I simply don't know, but um, that's the less of my uh, problems. Uh, I will just, uh, I really promise to, to do that, to find different groups of demons. Uh, it is, thanks God, like in India, so they are organized in, in uh, um, direction of the compass. Uh, I can uh, recognize them. And uh, this is actually all I can do. Uh, it is absolutely amazing thing that um, uh, new iconography was discovered. This. Uh, uh, bald headed Kambandas, it's really interesting uh, points. So um, I hope I'll find uh, more. The research uh, only starts. Um, uh, the book uh, about the demons of uh, Kucha will probably uh, appear in two or three years. So I still have time just to collect them all. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we look forward to the new research as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, Susan Huang, also from uh, Rice University, says thank you so much for this in inspiring talk. Uh, and she actually just discussed the demon with the second face on the belly in Mogao Cave 254 last week in class. Mm -hmm. uh, and she asks, can you say more about the kind of people who may have transmitted the image tradition from Gandhara to Kucha? Do we know anything about the painters making the Gandharan inspired images in Kucha? Oof, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Grünwedel pretended, um, and um, there are actually some inscriptions, um, uh, or Grünwedel had seen inscriptions, and uh, he writes about painters coming from um, from Syria. Why from Syria? I don't know, but. Um, uh, we, we cannot uh, see it actually. 
Um, I, I cannot uh, help it and um, we don't know and I afraid we will never know. Uh, the fact is that in uh, cave 207 um, and um, so in two caves of first Indo-Iranian style, uh, they depicted themselves. Uh, so there are painters standing with the brush and uh, um, on the side of, of the painting. So uh, 207, the name is um, Malerhöhle, so the cave of painters. Um, but um, actually, they, they look like Tokarians people, so it's nothing we really could could say more. Yeah. It, for somebody working with um, the second face on, on, on the belly, uh, have a look. I uh, depicted only, uh, I showed only a couple of them, but how many there are in Andhra? It's really absolutely popular. And there are so many different um, dwarfs. Yeah, I think it's generated from there. Well, thank you. Um, we also have a question from uh, Simona Lazzarini. Uh, thank you so much for this fascinating lecture. Do you think that demons are so popular in Kucha paintings to testify to the great powers of the Buddha in converting demons and bringing them under Buddhism? Among others, among others, this is the, uh, the book of uh, Robert de Caroli about, um, uh, and definitely he's, he's right. Uh, so uh, the demons are danger. We have it on so many uh, representations, they are very danger, but the Buddha has them under control. This is what the pictures are saying. They are, the Buddha is in the middle and they are worshiping the Buddha. So this is the, the most important uh, point, probably not only the Buddha, which is also what, um, what's the book of the Karoli about. It's not only the Buddha, but this is the Sangha. So this this wild world um, outside and uh, peaceful world in, in the monastery. Uh, here the, the demons don't come in. Um, and so I really believe it was something like that also there. Uh, what the Karoli does not write about, perhaps it was not an issue in, in uh, India, but in Kucha, I really think that there was this political aspect. There was this danger time, and uh, let's call it Tantra, <laughs> that, was, that we really need, <laughs> we need danger demons just to keep all yeah, Turks outside. <laughs> uh, thank you. We have uh, also a question from uh, Jin Shu, who says, I was wondering if there are any examples of demonic creatures from the ancient Iranian culture depicted at Kucha or any demons that show Iranian influence. Um, I think so. I didn't want to make my lectures still longer, but representations of um, uh, mixed creatures with um, uh, long beards and um, um, animal ears, um, you have them everywhere, actually, also, so that they don't necessarily have to come from, from India because they, they are also, also there. So I uh, can really imagine that um, they were coming from, uh, from there. Um, actually, it would not surprise me at all uh, in Sogdia, Sogdiana, because their the influences from uh, from uh, Iran are much stronger there. Um, about Kucha people, we actually see strong influences from India. Why they wanted to be more Indian than Indians, that's a really a strange point. That's really a strange point. So um, for me, it was just this, this Shraddha. We don't know nowhere in, in the Buddhist world anything like that. We know from places like Bodhgaya, which were Buddhist places, but people from uh, Brahmanical religion coming just for, for because the, the place was holy. Maybe it was already holy before Buddhism came. So that, that's a possible explanation. But um, when we don't have Hindu temples there, and they take these deities, however they, they could understand them. We don't know. So 
Um, I promise to work on that. Uh, and in the book, I will also um, analyze influences from uh, Iran. Um, I don't expect uh, a lot, but it has to be checked. Thank you for the questions. Good question. Thanks. Uh, this question is from Ashwini, Ashwini uh, Lakshmi Narayanan. And it's a little bit similar to a question we had, but I don't know if it'll have the same answer or not. Uh, dear Professor Zinn, thank you so much for this interesting talk. I would like to know during your research if you found any information regarding the artists, uh, especially the, for the demons and yakshas that present multicultural influences, Bactrian, India, or Mediterranean, or, or any signature of the painters themselves, such as in Miran uh, at Kucha. Thank you. So that that I answer already uh, that there are in this, indeed some some names and the representations of uh, of the painters. Um, if we should actually um, make demons something really special and um, more important for influences from um, from wherever, I don't know. Actually, uh, we have it everywhere, and the most visible, uh, in the most visible way, in, in ornaments. When we um, when. Um, the content was of less importance and, and you could show everything outside. Um, so in there are really Western. Um, that's not necessarily Indian, um, but really Western uh, ornaments. Um, well, we have now really interesting uh, PhD uh, work about it. Uh, Luca de Fabrizis, uh, he is from uh, Rome and uh, he says this, I know from uh, from Rome, just a church in, on my street, <laughs> exactly the same ornaments. <laughs> so um, not, um, not only uh, demons, so there was uh, talk about that, but uh, I think we have such influences actually wherever you touch, you, you will find something, yeah. Very transnational. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Kamala Vishweshwaran. Uh, Professor Zinn, can you please say more about the political significance of the paintings that you ended your talk with? Well, <laughs> um, we know too little, and um, actually, we suppose influence of. Um, um, heftalites uh, or Alchion or different groups uh, of them. Uh, and I really believe one day we'll know more. But uh, for a time being, we can analyze uh, some tiny uh, pieces just and hope that from this mosaic one day we'll know really more. But uh, when you search uh, for what Sato Mihiyama did um, in, in her book. Um, when you analyze the uh, headdress uh, in first Indo-Iranian style, uh, and you look at these um, uh, coins from uh, Honig people, let's say, you can even try to make dating. Like he, uh, she um, dates uh, painter's cave uh, between 510, 530, because only in this time, uh, this particular type of crown uh, appears. There are two um, wings like, like that. So um, there were influences. What we don't know if um, heftalites, for example, were really there, but influences you see just um, on ornaments or, or, or demons, or whatever. So um, Kucha was definitely influenced by, the, by this um, important part uh, of Indian history uh, when um, Gupta empire collapsed and this new powers uh, appears and new powers were much closer, but also uh, uh, maybe there is still more than that. Um, uh, not only political, but also entire culture exchange, uh, which we can uh, see um, on the art of building, uh, uh, who knows 
Indian um, architecture, when you are in Ajanta Cave uh, 17, there is secondary edit, um, circumambulation behind the Buddha, and it is square. Actually, it looks exactly like uh, Central Pillar Cave in small. It is only antechamber and chamber behind on, on the back of, uh, of Ajanta 17. And it was definitely not from the beginning, but it was added around 500. So um, maybe there was just new rules and um, with the same school, Mula Sarvastivada here and there. So there was just a move not only of um, or influenced by, by politics, but uh, entire um, Buddhism uh, moved from, from uh, Central India to Central Asia. Um, so the politics, what I really wanted to uh, show in the, just on the, on the end of a lecture, because I find it's uh, absolutely fascinating what was Bakker wrote recently about it, and just all this, this um, um, this epoch when all of a sudden uh, you see on artifacts found in, in uh, Great Gandhara exactly the same ornaments like we know from, from paintings in Ajanta. So that was, uh, um, so I should stop talking about it and answer your question. The question is, I hope we will know more, uh, but uh, for a time being, don't um, uh, blame me for, uh, making um, abstract uh, influences on politics because we actually don't have real proofs uh, that Hefta lies were there and that um, paintings or culture of Kucha were indeed under influences because we still have to have to work on that. But uh, I actually believe that it uh, must have been influences of that. Well, thank you very much. So we'll, we should try to wrap up soon, but I'll just try to squeeze in a couple more questions that have hit on uh, topics we haven't talked about as much mm -hmm. yet. Um, Beatrice Chan uh, says, many of the demons seem to be derived from non-Buddhist deities in a religious political context. Are there demons that originate or are considered more symbolic representations of abstract Buddhist theology? Um, well, uh, with abstract and, and symbolic, of course, we uh, always have something like that. There are good uh, yakshas with coins falling, uh, and so, so like like abstract of uh, of treasures. Of so, so there are symbolic representations of uh, of the yakshas uh, or or demons. Uh, generally speaking, that um, what belongs to Chatur Maharajas, uh, there are always sort of symbolic because they, they are standing for, for direction. So whoever is coming with them, that they belong to, to somehow to, to abstract. So Nagas are important for rain, so that, that uh, they are in some point always uh, symbolic. Um, how far it was of importance for, for Kucha, I simply don't know, and I'm afraid we will never know. So symbolic um, uh, meaning, maybe maybe you, are, um, you know, for example, a book by um, Angela Falco Howard, uh, who likes to um, understand the paintings like vision on, of the monks during meditation. Uh, and she also takes uh, some examples of um, different aquatic uh, water, <laughs> water um, animals, and uh, like directly illustrating um, uh, Buddhist um, um, topics of, of uh, during meditation. And so, uh, of course, you can you can do it, and. Um, I cannot say that this is not uh, true, uh, can very well be, but um, what I hope I will be able to show in the, in the book coming is that these um, yakshas actually belong to the um, representation of the world. Uh, as I showed you on the, on the beginning, this is the, the painters are playing with it. We are inside the mountain, but there is a presentation of the mountains and um, with all these um, spooky places and, and uh, individuals, which are sort of danger. Um, this is um, a program. 
this is a program uh, inside and um, they must be there. And when we have a wall with uh, eight, that's typical eight um, uh, ceremonies on, on one wall, and three of those eight uh, concern yakshas or, or different demons, uh, it is of importance and they belong uh, simply to there. Uh, so, sort of apotropaic feeling, uh, raksha, like we have raksha, raksha literature, so we also can have raksha um, depictions just, just um, uh, to keep all danger uh, outside. Um, that's one point, including politics, and, and uh, it, it can be incorporated into that, uh, of course. So, uh, symbols in such uh, understanding, I actually think that, that they are. If a particular one are symbols for something Buddhist or something, I don't know, but um, I must be wrong. And I can be wrong. So. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, wait, uh, I'll, I'll just ask one more question. I think we should wrap up soon, but this is an uh, interesting direction. Uh, Shivani Baltra asks if there are any connections to uh, Jain traditions, uh, especially like deities that are related to cobras and things like that? Um, not really. I So uh, China um, did not find their way there. We have absolutely no records that um, uh, China believers or, or were on, on the territory, we don't know. Uh, it might be of interest for you that we have depictions of Jainas and uh, not only Jainas, we have depictions of uh, Ajivikas as well. Um, not that um, people knew how they look like, but um, they made their own iconography. Um, uh, Ajivikas are dark blue, gesticulate stupidly, and um, and they have a ring in their penis, which is probably a sign of um, ascetic. And uh, Jaina, um, uh, that must be uh, just uh, only in, in Kucha, because nothing like that is, is known from India, uh, they are wearing really underneath the breath, uh, uh, breath that they are wearing um, white scarf and here a cross. So something really um, strange. And because we have depictions and we know what's, what Sutra is depicted. So the, the stories uh, about Vajrapani holding um, uh, glowing Vajra about them. So we can say for sure that they are Jainas and they repeat in several, several uh, representations. So they were not unknown. Uh, but uh, influences from um, Jaina culture, I would not expect there. Great, thank you. Well, we have uh, dozens more questions from other scholars <laughs> around the world who have attended today that unfortunately, I don't think we have time to get to all of them. And I didn't get to ask any questions either. So <laughs> I'll have to follow up with you at some point. Uh, but thank you to everyone who uh, attended today. This has been a really wonderful event. Uh, and thank you very much, Professor Zinn, for this amazing lecture and uh, insight and knowledge into all the questions uh, that all of you have asked. Thank you so I must much. Thank you. Many thanks for, for uh, Rice University, uh, for you and Amber for organizing that. That was really nice to visit you, even I'm still in Leipzig. Best wishes from Leipzig. <laughs> thank you. Bye.